Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Dr. Travis Brown, what is this medical life all about? This is the pursuit of knowledge as we learn about diseases from the ancient times to the present day. These are the stories of medicine. Dr. Travis Brown, you've raised the topic of rheumatoid arthritis, and I remember some great uncles and aunties with really knobbly knuckles and complaints about aches and pains. Uh, I've got my own daughter who cracks her fingers a lot. I'm going to ask our guest about that when he joins us. Um, what? How are we going to tackle rheumatoid arthritis well, the, in this episode? The interesting thing about this, while you mentioned your, your family, is one time I was watching a movie. There was a, a movie, uh, Maverick, uh, with uh, not the not the new not one, the, <laughs> uh, the one with uh, Mel Gibson, Jodie Foster, and, and James Gardner. It's, it, look, it's a fun movie. I, I loved it. Uh, really wittily wrote. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember watching it, and one of the actors I saw, his name was actually he, he was the the character was uh, Commodore Duval. His name was Joe James Coneborn. He was the older character who's setting up. It's a poker tournament. He's the one who's funding the whole thing when, you know, half a million, uh, whatever dollars it was. And I saw his hand on the movie and I went, oh, he has rheumatoid arthritis. And because I saw he had these big knuckles on his thing and the ulnar deviation on these on his hands. It was just a, a bit of a strike. It's not a not a thing I do, but I just <laughs> noticed that he had rheumatoid arthritis, and he does in real life. And and it, it was just a, a moment. Now, what is rheumatoid arthritis? Look, it's actually it's, before you get onto that, I yeah. I, I wish I was watching Batman, you know, the Joker movie with you, and have you diagnosed? <laughs> the no, vi- that's a, I I love that one. He was uh, Heath Ledger did a brilliant job, <laughs> captivating. But no, psychology, not my okay. uh, or psychiatry. <laughs> right, onto the definitions. Here we go. But look, uh, with with rheumatoid arthritis, it is an autoimmune disease, and it's principally of uh, of the joints. Or it's an inflammatory arthritis, but there are systemic effects, and it, it is important to know about that. And we'll discuss with our guests coming up. But when we look at the word rheumatism, it's quite interesting because it's a Greek word and it was used by Greek, but it actually rheuma is means to flow. And what they used it for was when someone got unwell and it was to flow with phlegm. Oh. And so actually, over time, it's been associated with joints, but I'm not quite sure how that connection was made because it's not got anything to do with the word. No. And th- there was even a, a description of, of what we think might be rheumatoid arthritis from Hippocrates. In the arthritis, which generally shows itself about the age of 35... There is frequently no great interval between the affection of the hands and feet, both these becoming similar in nature, slender with little flesh. For the most part, their arthritis passeth from the feet to the hands, next the elbows and knees, after these the hip joint. It is incredible how fast the mischief spreads. And so that that could be, it may not be, it might be completely unrelated, but this is looking a few thousand years back. So the the interesting thing, though, about rheumatoid arthritis is we don't get definitive proof of its identification until the 18th century. And and look, there's a hypothesis uh, that it was associated with the sugar trade out of the UK, and it, it it, it came along with the the peak trading at this time, and this is when it was started to be noticed as a disease. It's quite interesting because uh, there's a whole bunch of discussion about the taxation that goes through and that, that suddenly this disease appeared. Uh, so there is even some uh, suggestion, if you go searching, everything's on the internet, of course, yeah. but uh, you, so sugar, high sugar can flare things up. Whether that's true or not... Uh, We'll we'll discuss with our guests, but look, it, it is a it is an interesting connection to make that 
when they were starting to understand this, it was joint disease was just put into joint disease. And most of it was really two. One was osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. So that's what we we know today, joint disease, uh, mechanical problems, and gout. And gout, again, we've discussed on this podcast before, but it was also, gout was quite attractive to physicians at this time. And the reason why it was attractive to to treat is because patients were often rich, Ah. affluent. They could pay their medical bills. They had a lot of money to throw at it. The problem was this probably changed things a little bit because these people tended to be a little bit poorer. And the person who is actually the most prominent in this field was a a French medical student then became doctor. His name was Augustine Jacob Londre Beauvais. Now, they just shorten it to Londre Beauvais, but he, he had a distinct subset of patients with this joint disease. Now, he was working out of Paris, out of uh, Saltpetriere Hospice, and he identified nine patients, all of the women. They were mostly poor. They had this characteristic capsular swelling around their joints. There was limitations of movement, particularly of the hands and feet, and they had this bony alkalosis, which was a stiffening of the joint. And he wrote about this disease. We must recognize the existence of a new form of gout under the designation primary asthenic gout. And so he wasn't ready to get rid of the word gout. And I guess probably at that point in time, gout was associated with joint disease. So there was a, a linkage that was made. Now... He was actually quite revolutionary in his approach to this because he thought there might also be associated psychological factors. He's, he was an advocate for gentle treatments, and he also said that there was uh, an inappropriate because bloodletting was also a common treatment for, mm-hmm. well, pretty much everything. Yes. And so he said, no, it's not appropriate to do that, going against medical conv- convention of the time. And there's always a caveat that more research is needed. And there was a physician in the 19th century, Alfred uh, Jarrod, who then found that there was two distinct groups again, much like uh, previously, and he had patients with gout and patients without gout. And he noticed that the patients with gout had increased uric acid. Mm-hmm. And those who didn't have gout, didn't have the, the the associated uric acid. So he's gone, well, this must be some sort of disease. He called it rheumatic gout. And it's interesting because his fourth son took on this family interest. His name was Archibald Jarrett, and he wrote a treatise on rheumatism and rheumatoid arthritis. He gave it the name. And we finally get there. <laughs> and this is interesting because he started to recognize, well, this must be a new disease because it's so obvious it can't have existed because someone would have known about it previously. And so he he noted that uh, this was a, a new disease that he had uh, identified, just had come on through. And the interesting thing about this is... Rheumatoid arthritis is such a complex disease. And the reason I'm bringing it today as an episode is because it's it's a component of there's genetics, there's the immune system, there's autoimmune disease, there's joint or articular and extra articular disease manifestations, and there's uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs known as DMARDs, which, <laughs> mouthful, but these are the field that rheumatoid arthritis fits in. And look, with all this complexity, it's an, it's dealt with by a specialty, rheumatologists and immunologists. And I guess in, in contrast to Archibald's quote, there's one that really hits home for me. It's probably the, the almost the, the mantra of this, this medical life podcast. Disease is very old and nothing about it has changed. It is we who change as we learn to recognize what was formerly imperceptible. Dr. 
Dr. Damon Langeth is an immunologist and head of the immunology department at Sullivan Nicolades Pathology. He has particular expertise in the investigation of autoimmune disease, allergy and immune deficiency. Dr. Langeth gained his medical qualifications at Auckland Medical School, New Zealand, and trained in rheumatology and immunology in Perth and Brisbane. He has fellowships and memberships of the Australian Rheumatology Association, the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology, the Federation of Clinical Immunology Societies, the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia, and the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Dr. Langeth is widely published and is a returning guest for This Medical Life, and we appreciate that dearly. Welcome back, Damon. Thanks very much, Steve. Damon, can I get the ball rolling in this part of our episode and ask just how prevalent is rheumatoid arthritis today? So we know that uh, depending on which population you look at, but um, fairly uh, exhaustive studies come up with about one in 200 or perhaps a little bit over that is prevalence. So obviously the disease, once you've got it, we, we never actually say you haven't got it anymore. We don't say rheumatoid arthritis goes away. Oh, there's a fine nuance there. It's it's a disease for life. Right. It doesn't mean you're going to be terribly crippled your whole life or mm-hmm. disabled, uh, but it does mean that for a significant number, particularly those people who are what's called seropositive or those that make CCP antibodies, cyclic citronellated peptides, or the Americans tend to call them ACPA anti-cyclic um, peptide antibodies. All right. Just before Dr. Travis Brown <laughs> launches in with more technical questions, could you lead us through what the risk factors are? And I ask as a dad of a 14-year-old daughter who loves cracking her fingers all the time, <laughs> and I know there is a tenuous link, or maybe none whatsoever. Yeah, you're shaking your head. All right. And the GP's listening. I apologise. But let's look at the risk factors more broadly. No, um, snapping joints uh, is just two surfaces being pulled apart with an air bubble being released. <laughs> um, that That's all that noise is. It okay. has no bearing on the development of any arthritis, unless, of course, you snap them so viciously that you might break them. But uh, <laughs> but um, no, uh, doing that in no way is dangerous. Okay. Um, now, risk factors, the biggest modifiable risk factor is smoking. Oh. So that... Uh, Cigarette smoking, we're talking about, particularly interacts with those people with a uh, genetic background to produce um, CCP antibodies. Now, obviously, you have to have that genetic background, and obviously not everyone who smokes with that genetic background will develop rheumatoid arthritis, but it is a known modifiable risk factor. I mean, in Australia, adult smoking rate sits at about 12 to 13%. So we've already modified that a great deal. And the risk probably comes early rather than late. So it's not you have to smoke 4 million packets of cigarettes. Right. Um, It's probably just that you started when you were a teenager uh, and then you develop rheumatoid arthritis. And it's unlikely, like in most diseases, there's not one risk factor. There are lots of risk factors. Randomness being a risk factor in the immune system because the immune system has a degree of programmed randomness. So in other words, when you're making T and B cells, there's deliberate mutation in their DNA so that you can come up with an immense variable uh, range of, say, T cell receptors or immunoglobulins. It's the only area in medicine, in sorry, in human uh, biology where deliberate mutation is allowed and encouraged. Mm-hmm. So not actually in the gene line, but in, when you are making the proteins, because uh, you can't possibly have enough genes to encode for every possible T cell receptor, you're talking about 10 to the 12, so a lot. And you have to have a way of coming up with that number of uh, possibilities. And the way is that um, we allow certain areas to undergo genetic change so that we can produce them. Um, Going back to uh, the risk factors, um, a risk factor which we've actually known about for Uh, 20 years has come to the fore more recently, and that's periodontitis. So we know that bugs in the mouth, um, one in particular, which I forget the name of, um, has uh, enzymes which produce uh, deamidation 
um, to make citrulline so that um, if you're a smoker, and of course smoking smokers are more likely to develop periodontitis because uh, the effects of, of cigarette smoke on the mouth, and you have a genetic background, you're more likely to develop rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there are some changes in the gut as well. So there is some uh, bacteria, Prevotella, um, when it's present in the gut at higher numbers, um, it seems to have a population effect. So, you know, the indiv individual effects are very small. Uh, but when you look at populations, you can see that certain gut changes. So, you know, a common theme across uh, autoimmunity and, and medicine nowadays is the biofilm. Um, so we've got two examples there of the biofilm, the biofilm in your mouth and the biofilm further down in your gut. And so if you perhaps are a smoker, you've got periodontitis and you happen to have those both those bugs sitting in you, in you more often, then you're doing as much as you can to develop rheumatoid arthritis. Gee. Um, there are some other genetic markers, Steve, but they all have fairly kind of low you know, odds ratio. So in other words, they really only increase your risk of rheumatoid arthritis by by maybe t twice at most so they're not they're not that useful and we certainly don't go measuring them unless we're looking at uh, clinical research if only the general population could understand with wonder <laughs> what there is in our human body maybe that 12 to 15 percent of persistent smokers might drop but mm, i think that's wishful thinking <laughs> yeah, steve i think it is um, you might say that about a whole lot of other things, you know, in invading Ukraine, all those kinds of things. Exactly. <laughs> Looking then, non-modifiable risk factors. So uh, from my reading, women are far more likely. Is it younger or older? Yeah, the, the, the sort of peak age is 18 through to 30. Um, that's pretty common for a va the vast majority of autoimmune disease. The exact mechanisms through which women have a much greater rate of autoimmunity are not entirely known. It's not as simple as uh, it being um, to hormone levels. There is a group, there's sort of two groups of people. One group of people think it's hormones, in other words, estrogen, and the other think that it's the dosing of the X chromosome. So in other words, there are lots of genes on the X chromosome compared to genes on the Y chromosome. Y chromosome is pretty sort of runtish. But, and so if you've got more of those genes, then you're more, perhaps more likely to develop autoimmunity, uh, women compared to men. The interesting thing, however, is that if you look at a different disease, which has been studied a bit more in this area, from the age of menopause, lupus occurs in men and women equally. So it's not very common in that age group, but it does occur exactly equally between men and women, whether it's nine to one in women before the age of menopause. So that does tend to indicate that that hormone levels probably play a significant role. And I would think the other genes on the X chromosome are something that probably interacts as well. Mm. So then what will be the probably most common pres presenting symptom for someone new uh, with rheumatoid arthritis? Um, so the most common thing would be the insidious onset, usually over six weeks, of inflamed, painful and stiff joints. Um, it doesn't have to be lots of joints. Some people have a more palsy immune presentation. Um, unlucky people wake up the next day and can't move. <sighs> Uh, so there are a range of presentations, but the most common would be um, involvement of the small joints of the hand, particularly the MCPs and the wrists, that it should be relatively symmetrical. Um, the only reason it's not symmetrical is you can see development in people who've had a stroke or have a par paralyzed limb, and the disease can, be can either be super aggressive in the abnormal limb or avoid it completely. So it it's unusual. Um, and the key is it's that time where we really wanted to start treatment. Right. We know that if we are going to prevent severe disease, prevent long-term damage to joints, then we're really treating this as a rheumatologic emergency. Um, I think emergency in medicine is used a bit over the top, but, but it really is saying this is a disease where we've got a short space of time to get on top of things. Right. Uh, gone are the days when I, when I was a registrar, we sort of gave a little bit of methotrexate, uh, perhaps after you're already quite bad, 
uh, and then we gave a little bit more and we would often take a year to get on top of things. And it's that, that year that actually sets up secondary osteoarthritis, mm. you get damaged tendons, you get muscle weakness because your joints hurt, um, you increase your risk of cardiovascular disease because of the rheumatoid arthritis. Um, any form of chronic inflammation uh, increases the risk of a cardiovascular disease as a sort of blanket statement. Um, and so to prevent all of those things, you want to start treatment very early. Right. That's <laughs> changed everything about my thinking of it. Now, is there different classifications? Is rheumatoid arthritis, is there an acute or chronic or is how, how does that work? Uh, well, no, I mean, by de definition, eventually everyone has chronic rheumatoid arthritis who's seropositive because it's a disease forever. Right. Um, it's very hard to run out of target. Uh, because you can't destroy all of your synovium. Uh, some people, trust me, have given it a good go uh, in the bad old days where we didn't have effective treatment. Now, we've had methotrexate, at least in some form, since the mid-80s. But it has taken a long time for us to become what we would now term aggressive and use that drug appropriately. Uh, we know that subcutaneous methotrexate works better than oral methotrexate, so it took about 20 years to work that out. Mm. Uh, and um, so that makes a difference as well. Um, acute disease is just disease in the first six weeks. And yes, it can be hard because there are diagnostic criteria that suggest it's got to be present for a certain amount of time. But frankly, if, you, if you're CCP antibody positive, you've got an elevated CRP and you've got someone who knows what rheumatoid arthritis looks like and they look at your hands, uh, then um, you can make that diagnosis. We also now have other ways of investigating. So plenty of rheumatologists uh, do in rooms uh, ultrasound so that you can get um, ultrasounds that hook up to your iPhone or to your normal uh, computer uh, and you can scan and look for synovial thickening because uh, some people, don't when they come, they don't have the swelling. They have it at other times but they may swell less. And so this is a diagnostic aid. Um, you can also do MRI. Um, so there are various ways of doing that. It increases the chance that you get a correct diagnosis right at the start. Wow. Uh, just looking at this, the disease then, now there's certainly the joint manifestations, but is there other complications of rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah, if, if you leave rheumatoid arthritis unchecked, which we essentially did in the early 80s and late 1970s and all the time before then, um, it actually is a pan body disease. So you can get a secondary vasculitis, which looks like polyarteritis nodosa. It's, it's indistinguishable from it. Um, you can get secondary joint damage, of course, and osteoporosis, uh, sorry, uh, um, osteoarthritis. Um, of course, with the treatments, and lots of people have used lots of steroid over the time, there are a myriad, as we all know, of thousands of side effects of prednisolone or prednisone, whichever you want to use. Um, the other things are that you can develop lung disease. So uh, bronchiectasis is seen at increased risk in people with uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis. You can get uh, pulmonary nodules and you can also get interstitial lung disease, which often is untreatable in rheumatoid. It can affect the eyes, so you can get um, scleral melt. Uh, so there are lots of manifestations outside the joint, but usually, when, and when I say usually, nearly always, they are a sign of uncontrolled disease for some significant time. Um, we'd all be aware of um, no nodules from rheumatoid arthritis, which occur on usually extensive surfaces, uh, and they can be quite problematic. We don't see them very often anymore because we ha the vast majority of people um, have effective treatment. Right. And then just looking at uh, flares, because one of the, the, the stories in the lead-in is that uh, they, they associate sugar with some of the uh, flares. And, and I think that might to do with periodontal disease that you mentioned earlier, that uh, their identification came with the rheumatoid arthritis. But is there anything that can predict acute flares or can give us an idea about who is likely to flare? Uh, well, the people who are likely to flare are the people who've had significant flares already. Um, it's like most autoimmune diseases. How can you tell if they're going to be bad? Well, if they're bad already. 
Right. right. Um, and so that's not that useful if you're dealing with someone right at the start. But even then, if you've got the more joints involved and the more your normal life is impaired, that says to you as a doctor, this person is more likely to suffer. Right. Um, so CCP antibodies, obviously, um, they are they are what seropositive is now. Um, we don't really need to use rheumatoid factor. It's uh, less predictive and less specific. So rheumatoid factor is found in a lot of conditions. Uh, plenty of people with no disease at all can have low positive rheumatoid factors. It's CCP that says to us, this person is at risk and they're at risk for developing joint erosions. So erosions are holes at the edge of your joint which mark severity of disease and that's how rheumatoid destroys your joint surfaces. We're going to pause briefly before we return, but dear listener, when Dr. Travis Brown mentioned sugar being a possible trigger, you should have seen Damon's facial reaction. <laughs> what was that based on, Damon? Yeah, I don't think you can blame sugar on... You can blame a lot for sugar, but I don't think it causes rheumatoid arthritis. All right. We'll be back with the next part of the episode in just a moment. I'm going to go out to the smoking area and look <laughs> with pathos upon the smokers. Damon Langeth now to continue our discussion about rheumatoid arthritis. Damon, one thing we haven't touched on is is how is it diagnosed? Uh, well, it's a mix of clinical history uh, and some blood tests and occasionally some imaging. Um, sometimes it can be more difficult because the person's um, history, either because they can't tell you or because the way that they feel their inflammation is different to others. We're all taught at medical school that you know most diseases present in just a simple way. You just ask these questions and, and all patients are the same. It'll be very reliable and tell you, yes, I've got three hours of morning stiffness through all the small joints of my hands when some people will just go, I'm stiff. And uh, occasionally you can see, I, I've had patients who clearly have synovitis, which you can see, and they say things like, it's my muscles that hurt. And it's just the way that they appreciate their pain and stiffness mm. um, is different to other people. Um, so really, it, you know, like in nearly all diseases, uh, history, uh, we confirm that with uh, blood tests. We look at some monitoring blood tests. You can have a normal CRP and have bad rheumatoid arthritis. So it's not, not a 100% sensitive marker. So in those patients, it's actually you can't use CRP to be a guide. Um, the vast majority, however, of seropositive disease do have an elevated CRP. Um, to give you an idea, some other uh, inflammatory arthritis rarely have an elevated CRP. So psoriatic arthritis, which can look almost exactly the same, uh, occasionally doesn't have an elevated CRP a lot of the time, uh, even though there's clearly inflammation. It's lucky that rheumatoid does because it does help us manage um, patients the government use it as criteria for continuing uh, biologic treatment. Um, so we, as a rheumatologist, when you are seeing a patient with um, rheumatoid arthritis on one of the many biologics now, or novel uh, oral medications, we have to fill in score sheets that say, yes, the CRP is down, they can keep having the drug. Mm. To some extent, those rules were non-evidence and finance-based rules. So then looking at the, the diagnosis, uh, rheumatoid factor appears to be appears quite a bit. From our earlier discussion, would anti-CCP be more appropriate in this in this regards? Oh yeah, much much more appropriate. Um, the, the additive value of rheumatoid factor is very little. Occasional patients will make rheumatoid factor and then take a little while to make CCP antibodies. Um, so you do get your sensitivity up to about 80 82 percent by doing both right. but you're really only dropping right at the start um ccp is about 65 70 percent right and that's our patients who, who who are um who clearly have rheumatoid as judged by you know blinded experts kind of thing mm. so with with the anti-ccp then does that go away with no. with treatment no no um you, we don't monitor it uh it doesn't go away they're a signature part of the disease. 
Um, so there's no, no value at all in repeat measurements of it. Right. Um, you can tend to see if people do very well, uh, they their CCP antibodies may fall, but that's of academic interest only. Right. Is CCP raised in any other disease or diseases? Uh, rarely. Right. Um, all, all, all autoantibodies can appear in people without the disease. Um, but you can see it in um, hepatitis C and HIV can both have um, CCP antibodies, but um, they're not a very com- that's not a common issue. Mm-hmm. There are some genes that are associated with rheumatoid arthritis, and we can test for them. It's a, there's one that's HLA-DRB1 and HLA-A and B. Uh, is there any clinical utility to testing for these? Uh, no, no. Um, they really are of research interest. Um, we do know that uh, if um, we're doing genetic studies, i.e. trying to come up with the vaccines to stop rheumatoid, uh, that obviously we need to do HLA typing and work out what we're doing, but that's a research-only test. There's no value in a general practitioner or even a r- rheumatologist, really. If you've got the disease, you've got the disease, mm-hmm. uh, and it doesn't help you to know if they have the sh- what's called the shared epitope, which is a... D- uh, on DR4, so that's DRB1, um, uh, oh, sorry, DRB10401 and 0404, they're the majority of it. Um, even those things differ because in some populations, um, you really only see uh, DRB401 uh, because 0404 doesn't exist. So um, it, it depends uh, where you come from um, and uh, your ethnic or historical background. Um, which genes you're likely to carry. But uh, unfortunately, there are no groups of people who don't get rheumatoid arthritis. Mm, Okay. Now, we've mentioned it a few times, uh, and I haven't defined it, but looking at what is is the definition of a seronegative rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, The definition is that you are uh, rheumatoid factor negative and CCP antibody negative. Right. Okay. So how do we manage people that fall into that category? Well, we actually manage them much the same as um, seropositive people. Um, they are less likely to develop joint erosions. Um, seronegative disease probably just shouldn't be called rheumatoid arthritis, but we haven't moved it away from there right. uh, because it's clear that the seronegative group aren't a single group. It's not the same disease in everyone. Right. Uh, and there are various characteristics, and they probably you know, all should be clustered together depending on their features. But clinically... When we look at imaging, uh, examination and history, we treat them almost exactly the same. Right. And now just looking at then inactive rheumatoid arthritis, or probably well-managed is probably the better better term, Do they? is it treatment for life or is it able to be reduced? I was taught by senior people more than me that uh, you only risk a disease flare by reducing treatment. And given that uh, every flare they have means that you are destroying joints to some extent and increasing your risk for cardiovascular disease, why would you do that unless there were any particular dangers on what you were doing? Um, So it's all about um, trading risks and benefits. Um, In seronegative people, um, there is a a chance that you get completely off treatment and do not need further treatment. The earlier we start treatment, the more likely that is. If you look at all of the uh, disease downgrading treatment trials in seropositive people, a significant number of those people flare. Uh, and so you have to be very careful. Uh, it's hard to know. Um, it, you know, the patient's not going to be very happy with you if all of their symptoms come back. Whereas other patients are very happy to try and get off medication. And as we all know, the p- patients look at medication very differently. Some people just go, oh, yeah, I'll just take that every week. And other people think it's a major imposition. Uh, and that, that's the same with any disease. Uh, and obviously, the people who think it's a major imposition are more likely to try and come off. They're probably more likely to already be off without you even knowing. Um, but uh, you just need to make sure that they understand the risks to reducing medication. Um, there's, If you look at methotrexate, there's not much difference in risk between 10 milligrams and 25 milligrams. There is a big difference in the number of people who respond. Right. Then we're just turning to some of doing my reading through all of this, the classification criteria. You've got the American College of Rheumatology and the European Alliance. 
Are any of these useful to the to a general practitioner to know about or to have access to? No, to be honest, I don't think so. Um, I, I think an understanding that the earlier the treatment, the better. Uh, that you're looking for symmetrical involvement of joints. That stiffness rather than pain is a better diagnostic criteria, and particularly morning stiffness. Um, pain's very difficult because humans rate pain. You know, every, every single person rates things slightly differently. Where the stiffness, people when they've got it, people understand what that means. Yeah. Uh, and so, if you've got that and it's been present for any more than a month, you should be uh, thinking as a general practitioner: Is this rheumatoid arthritis? Um, some patients, of course, um, challenge us by having uh, intermittent disease, right. and so they will say, "Oh, yeah, last week my wrist was stiff for a week," and they'll come and see you. And you can't find anything. And then they'll come back two months later and they say, oh, you had two weeks of this hand, etc." And so that's sort of what we call palindromic rheumatism uh, does occur. Uh, and those people who have palindromic rheumatism who are CCP antibody positive uh, nearly all come to within five years of diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So there are people also who have a single joint involved. Now, you can't really make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, but they have a single joint and then maybe five years later develop into what obviously is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so you just have to try and treat those people the best that you can. Um, there are plenty of people who have oligoarthritis, uh, just to say, let's say, of a knee, entirely just one joint. Uh, and those people actually can be very difficult to treat. There can be very aggressive treatment. I'm uh, sorry, very aggressive disease and difficult to treat. Um, so given that we use a lot of the same drugs for, mo for different types of inflammatory arthritis, and you know, perhaps the term inflammatory arthritis, we really need to come up with a different term because osteoarthritis is actually quite inflammatory. Um, so it's inflammatory, but just in a different place and doesn't give you systemic symptoms, but it is actually inflammation, though um, it is useful to have a kind of rough um, catch-all in your brain so that patients understand when you're talking to them or other doctors whether you're talking about active destructive disease that is going to erode the synovium, or is it disease that's there from damage that's already occurred? Mm -hmm. And if you use the wrong drug for the wrong thing, it's not going to help. Methotrexate doesn't put um, synovium back there. It stops it being attacked, but it can't undo what's already been done, uh, undone. Mm -hmm. Just uh, as a general guide, what's the percentage of patients who don't respond well to treatment? I uh, would be very small now. I couldn't give you a percentage, mm. but a few percent. Right. Okay. Because uh, we have such an incredible array of treatments. There's off the top of my head, 10 biologics. There is five oral agents that are novel. And then there's the older agents such as hydroxychloroquine, silazoparin, methotrexate, and leflunamide. Uh, and there are many other agents in development. Um, unfortunately, there's always some people who uh, choose to have a truly awful disease, not that they was a deliberate choice, uh, and their disease is very aggressive. Um, interestingly, men can have quite an aggressive form, uh, young men, um, because clearly something, they're not even in the risk group, you see. So there's something unusual about them that allowed them, as opposed to any other man, as opposed to a, a woman, um, get rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and you do see this in autoimmune disease where there's a sex uh, difference in that men's disease doesn't behave exactly the same as women's disease. Mm. Is there any tests that are useful for uh, general practitioners in monitoring these patients who have rheumatoid arthritis? Um, well, there's two parts of monitoring. Most of the monitoring we do is actually not monitoring the disease with blood tests, but it's actually monitoring the drugs we use. Um, so in methotrexate, we look for liver test changes. Um, we now know that um, whilst alcohol is largely proscribed rather than prescribed, um, in methotrexate, it's certainly not the alcohol. Um, methotrexate's effects is fatty liver. Uh, and so if you have a fatty liver, you're more likely to have um, inflammation or uh, secondary liver test changes due to methotrexate. Um, a few of the other drugs um, can have uh, interesting effects, but most of the biologics actually are relatively uh, 
safe from the point of view of liver and blood count. Um, we do know that there are some diseases associated with rheumatoid. So um, uh, uh, neutropenia and other autoimmune diseases, you can see occasionally people become quite anemic because they've been either they are anemia of chronic disease or they have taken a fair bit of non-steroidal and given themselves a small GI bleed. So there's lots of reasons to do blood tests. Uh, but, you know, most of the time um, patients would be having a blood test three months at the most, every three months. Initially, when we start medication, we often do it monthly for six months and then we reduce frequency after that. Damon, we've been talking from a general practitioner's perspective, but when is it appropriate to refer a patient uh, to a specialist for management? Um, from my point of view, uh, anyone who has an inflammatory arthritis should be seen by a rheumatologist. Okay. Every and single patient. Uh, and some of those can and can um, quite happily go back to their general practitioner, but the vast majority are going to end up on medication that needs long-term monitoring. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, I mean, if you can keep up with that as a general practitioner, good on you. Uh, it's hard enough in rheumatology to do that. So, you know, we, we say that, um, for the starting disease modifying agents, we really want to see those people at the six week mark. All right. And look, just finally, any closing thoughts for GPs to bear in mind in relation to rheumatoid arthritis? I, I think just remember that it's common from the point of view of an autoimmune disease compared to a lot of other diseases that I would look after, which are like one in a hundred thousand kind of thing or one in a million, um, that it isn't just a joint disease, that if we don't control it, it can give you both short and long-term issues. The long-term issues being cardiovascular disease. So it, you, you've got to think that rheumatoid arthritis in young women is acting as if they were a smoker. It's that kind of risk factor for development of uh, cardiovascular disease. So often you see women in their 50s develop uh, heart attack or stroke um, because of uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis. And we know categorically that if we use uh, methotrexate, because it's got the biggest data set, um, and that ever receiving methotrexate reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease. Well, this has been a most enlightening episode, and I'll certainly keep my eye out uh, for morning stiffness with mixed emotions as we move forward now. But Dr. Damon Langer, thanks again for joining this Medical Life. Thanks very much, Steve. Glad to help. This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing Studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts via Twitter. Dr. Travis Brown is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's DR for doctor. And Steve Davis is at Steve Davis. Editing and production is by Tim Whiffen. Design is by Tom Buzenjad. This has been a Pathnotes Proprietary Limited production. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free. And you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.